This is the first of a series of video lectures that I'll be posting on Aristotle's work that we know as the metaphysics. But Aristotle himself didn't entitle this work Metaphysics that was given by a later editor. He thought of uh, what he was doing in this work as something he called first philosophy. So it's a work on the basic or core of philosophy itself. Um, and indeed, in the history of the Western tradition, metaphysics has been viewed uh, most often as the basic fundamental or foundational branch of philosophy. Maybe not so much a, a branch at all as the root of philosophy or the trunk. The Greek word philosophia is, of course, as most of you probably are, not, are familiar with, the word uh, that is the root of our English word philosophy. And it means literally the love of wisdom. So the object of philosophy is supposed to be wisdom. What is wisdom? This is the question that Aristotle is inquiring into in the first chapter of Book Alpha of the Metaphysics. And his answer is, wisdom is the knowledge of the first causes or first explanations of things. Wisdom is the knowledge of the first causes or first explanation of things. That is the most basic or fundamental explanations of the most universal or general things or realities. So this thing called metaphysics or first philosophy aims at wisdom for Aristotle which is um, a knowledge of first causes or explanations. So this brings us to our first discussion question. Is this a satisfactory understanding of wisdom? Wisdom as the knowledge of the first causes or explanations of things, the most basic or fundamental explanations of the most universal or general things. Is this a satisfactory understanding of wisdom? Is it really necessary for wisdom? Is having this kind of knowledge of the first causes or explanations of things necessary and sufficient for being a wise person? Is it necessary and sufficient for being a wise person that you understand the ultimate and universal explanation of everything? And in this connection, you might consider a related question to help guide your thinking about this first discussion question. Consider the related question, what is the value of wisdom? What is the value of wisdom according to you, according to your reflection on this question? Why would anyone desire to be wise? Okay, so wisdom is a type of knowledge according to Aristotle or related to knowledge. And so a partial answer to why anyone would desire to possess wisdom is given in uh, the famous line, which is um, page four of our translation. Uh, it's 780A in the uh, Becker numbering, which, is, which are the uh, boldface numbers that appear interspersed throughout the text. This is the uh, standard reference number, as you may, may have surmised if you didn't know that already, known as the Becker numbering after a, a German uh, philologist, scholar of the 19th century that put together a standard edition of Aristotle. So I'll generally cite the, the page number in our uh, Penguin Classics uh, edition here that we'll be working from, uh, as well as the Becker number, although sometimes I might forget. Uh, but that's what that refers to. So this, on page four, uh, we get the, the famous opening line um, of the book, by nature all men long to know. So for Aristotle, it's a biological, or we might say even a zoological fact about our species. By nature, we human beings long to know. We desire to know by our very nature. This, he says, is why we take delight in the senses, and especially in the sense of sight. Why the sense of sight? Why is the sense of sight our most important sense? Well, for Aristotle, it's because this is the sense that's able to distinguish the particularities of things, 
in the greatest detail and therefore provide us with the greatest uh, amount of knowledge and quality of knowledge. And it's because we desire to know that we value our senses. So we value sense as a uh, sight rather as the most cognitively fruitful and rich of our uh, five senses. So this initial observation that we all desire to know and that we take knowledge, uh, pleasure in our senses because of our desire for knowledge launches Aristotle on a classification of the types of knowledge in a sort of hierarchy. At the lower end of this hierarchy is experience. Experience, which is based on our recollections of what comes in through our senses. Uh, experience seems to be closely related to a form of knowledge that, that we call skill. Uh, especially if you think about uh, in practical terms, um, when you're putting together a resume, often the two terms, experience and skill, are brought together as a way to sort of um, uh, showcase your practical abilities and your usefulness to your potential employer. But that's in the practical realm. Uh, that's the realm of experience and skill. So our experience and skill just the same thing? It's a question that Aristotle considers. Uh, or are they different? And he wants to draw a distinction between experience versus skill. They're two separate um, types of knowledge. Skill is knowledge based not just on recollection and intuitive know-how, but rather on general knowledge. It involves theoretical understanding of general rules or principles, whereas experience just involves uh, recollection. Um, that in itself is kind of an interesting idea. So uh, experience for him is, isn't just an, an immediate sensory impression. It's the recollection. To have an experience is to, is to be able to recollect and connect different sensory impressions with one another. But th that is um, a more rudimentary form of knowledge compared to skill, which involves a kind of theoretical generality. Um, that ex experience doesn't necessarily have. So you have experience when you can look back and say, well, this thing worked for me in the past. Um, you know, I had this swollen toe and I drank a lot of water and it worked for me um, when my uh, uncle came around and he had a swollen toe. I said, hey, you know what worked for me? I drank a lot of water. You might try drinking a lot of water too. And it worked for him too. You know, so now I have this experience with remedies, home remedies for swollen toes. But that's something different from uh, skill. I can't, you know, present myself as a medical doctor. Right, or some kind of uh, health expert, even of an alternative form of medicine, just because I've had this experience that this home remedy works for me. Why? Well, Aristotle's explanation is um, I lack skill. I have experience, but I lack skill because I don't understand the general rule or principle behind why drinking a lot of water works to reduce this swollen toe. So a skilled person, for, for example, a person who understands that swelling in toes is often a symptom of gout, and gout is the consequence of a buildup of uric acid. You wouldn't necessarily even need to know it was uric acid, I think, to have skill. You could just re recognize a connection between, let's say, your diet. You know, if you ate a lot of fish or you ate a lot of meats that contain um, a substance, you don't know what it is, but you, you eat a lot of meat of a certain kind, and that makes your toes swell up. But when you... Um, drink water, you understand that, that flushes this, this substance out of your system. That's a form of skill because it, it involves a kind of theoretical generality and it enables you, for example, to ask questions of your uncle like, um, well, uh, you know, what's your diet? Uh, or have you been walking around barefoot a lot and maybe stepping on an anthill or something like that? You know, you, you need to have a kind of deeper understanding in order to understand whether this remedy of drinking a lot of water is actually going to help for the swelling of the toe. Is the problem too much uric acid in your bloodstream that could be flushed out by water? Or is the problem something else? 
that skill. It's not just a matter of experience, being able to recollect, you know, things that have worked in the past and this sort of thing. So um, Aristotle assumes that we will all agree that the skilled are wiser than the merely experienced. You know, if I talked to someone that I didn't know and I said, um, you know, I, I see that person over there is experiencing swelling in the toe. I think I'll, I'll go recommend to them that they, you know, drink water. And that person that I'm talking to and I say, I say that to says to me, you know why that is. That's because this person has gout and this is a condition that's caused by the buildup of uric acid. I would probably say, oh, wow, really? Teach me more. Right? I would acknowledge that person as a wiser person than I am. This person knows more about the same subject matter that I knew a little bit about. Okay? So that, that's the basic idea. Now this, for, for Aristotle, this has wide-ranging implications because the um, emphasis on generality, or another word for it, the knowledge of the universal versus the particular. So, um, the experienced person has knowledge of the particular. I had knowledge of my particular experience with drinking water and having that work to um, reduce the swelling of my toe. But the skilled person has knowledge of the universal. In other words, they know this general law that applies to all cases that are in a certain species, namely people who have um, an excessive amount of uric acid in their bloodstream. So um, the knowledge of universal or general principles for Aristotle is superior to the knowledge of particulars. And this is part of everyday common opinion. Uh, so he doesn't take this to be controversial. To have universal or general knowledge is to be wiser than a person who just has particular knowledge. So the skilled are wiser than the merely experienced. But there's something else to this as well. Uh, that goes back to this idea that wisdom involves knowledge of causes, is that the skilled know the cause, where the experience really, in a real sense, do not. You know, I know my, my toe swells up occasionally, but I don't know why. It just does. And I know that if I drink a lot of water, it tends to get better soon. But I don't know why. I don't, I don't know the cause. Right? The skilled person knows the cause. It's, it's the uric acid that's causing gout, that's causing a swelling of the joint, and so forth. So knowledge of particulars um, comes from the senses and from recollection, but merely having the ability to sense something doesn't give us knowledge of the cause. And wisdom, Aristotle concludes um, at the end of the first chapter of Alpha, belongs to knowledge of causes, which is it seems intrinsically something more universal or general than the particular impressions of the senses. To have the knowledge of a cause is to know something that applies not just to my particular case, but to a species of cases. Okay? So universal knowledge and knowledge of causes pertains to wisdom. So we've established by the time we began chapter two that wisdom is a knowledge involving general principles and causes. And from this, it does seem very natural, at least, to conclude that the highest wisdom or the most perfect wisdom would be knowledge of the highest or most perfect causes. And what would be the highest or most perfect cause? Well, if you think of this connection between causality or the notion of a cause and universality or generality, we can infer that the highest or the most perfect wisdom would be knowledge of the most universal causes. In other words, the most fundamental or ultimate causes are the most universal in scope. The cause of everything, the, the explanation of everything. Um, that's what would be the highest form of wisdom. And that, if philosophy is the love of wisdom, then that is what it would seek above all, is that highest form of wisdom, which would be knowledge of the ultimate cause. 
Okay. Now, in chapter two, Aristotle uh, digs a little more deeply into this idea of a principle or a cause. Um, and the form that this takes for him is to ask what kind of principles and what kind of causes is wisdom the knowledge of? We've already said it's of the most universal, right? But that um, is describing the scope of the causes, but not really what kind of cause is the most universal. So how is he going to answer this question? What kind of principle, what kind of cause is wisdom the knowledge of? Well, he answers this question indirectly by asking um, what is it that the possessor of wisdom possesses? What is it that the possessor of wisdom possesses? And the form that this inquiry takes for him is to ask, what are the common opinions we have about the wise man? What are, what are his characteristics? What are the characteristics of a wise man? Uh, and he focuses on uh, four things, and I'm not going to... Um, write these down for the sake of preserving time, but I will, I will say them slowly and repeat them, and so you can pause and review them if you want to um, uh, slow it down for the sake of taking notes or what, what have you. So the, the first characteristic of the wise man, which he discusses up on page 8, which is um, we're around 981a, 982a, excuse me, um, in the Becker numbers, uh, page 8 on our translation, and this goes into 982b. Uh, the first thing is that the wise man knows things at the general level, not merely at the level of particulars. So this is kind of a repeat of what we've already established, but that's the first characteristic of the wise man. The wise man knows things at the general level, not merely at the level of particulars. Second, the wise man knows things that it is difficult and not common for men to know. The wise man knows things that it is difficult and not common for men to know. Wisdom is something rare, in other words, in our common opinion about wisdom. Not everyone is wise. In fact, very few are wise, if any. Um, and this rules out uh, sense perceptions as being the subject matter of, of wisdom as well, because everyone has sense perceptions, but very few people uh, have wisdom. So the wise man knows things that it is difficult and not common for men to know. Third, the wise man is capable of te teaching the causes of things in connection with his knowledge. He can teach the causes of things in connection with his knowledge. So uh, this is closely related to the idea that was very important um, apparently for Socrates and Plato is that uh, the person who knows is able to give an account. It's not an inarticulate, an ineffable form of knowledge, a form of knowledge that you can't bring to words, but you're able to teach it. Um, and fourth, the wise man has a knowledge that is chosen for its own sake rather than its results and is directive rather than subservient. Um, the wise person seeks knowledge that's distinctive of wisdom for its own sake, not for some utilitarian purpose. Okay, so once again, um, the four characteristics very quickly are um, knows things at the general level, not merely at the level of particulars, knows things that it's difficult and not common for men to know, is capable of teaching the causes of things in connection with his knowledge, and has knowledge chosen for its own sake, rather than its results or um, serving some ulterior motive. Okay, now, um, Aristotle concludes here, I'm going to read uh, about the center of page 8 in our text. He says, For this man, in a way, knows all the subjects Wisdom is, is kind of like a conspectus of all the subjects. Um, it's sort of like absolute unconditioned knowledge that, en that encompasses everything in a way. In a way, that's an important qualification. For this man, in a way, knows all the subjects and more or less also the hardest for men to know, those that are most general. For these are furthest removed from the senses. So the, the general uh, knowledge 
of the ultimate causes is the hardest for men to know because it's the most uh, distant from the senses. Um, and so it's, it's more, it takes more of an effort to transcend the senses. That seems to be the implication here in order to arrive at this kind of general, more intellectual form of knowledge. So these are the, um, the uh, characteristics of the wise man. Now, what kind of knowledge fits the bill here? Well, um, three characteristics we can summarize it will have. One, it will be theoretical uh, as opposed to practical. It won't be know-how, but it will be conceptual, involving a kind of picture. The Greek word theoria is a, is a word for vision, so it's kind of a vision, a visionary knowledge, as opposed to a practical know-how kind of knowledge, technical knowledge. So it'll be theoretical. Uh, it will be exact, he says. Um, so the model here is going to be arithmetic, geometry, um, the exactitude of mathematics. It'll be theoretical. It will be exact. And it is a primary things. Primary things. Primary things are the things through which we know other things. Through which we know other things. So... You know, as an example, we can think that my, the knowledge of my own mortality is more primary um, because then, let's say, knowledge of, you know, um, where I live or what I had for breakfast because the knowledge of my mortality is um, that, you know, it, it's based upon a kind of knowledge of myself as a member of a species that is immortal and that's therefore going to die. It's based, it is through that sort of general knowledge, that more general theoretical knowledge of the mortality of the species of which I'm a member that I am able to know that I'm going to die, right? So it's that theoretical general knowledge about the species um, through which I'm able to draw this conclusion that um, I'm going to die. So more primary knowledge is knowledge through which you're able to know other things, and that's going to have this character of, of theoretical generality. Uh, okay. Now, Aristotle makes several more assertions about wisdom at, at the end, particularly um, pertaining to its non-instrumental, non-utilitarian, or useless character. And these, along with his, his claim that wisdom has to be exact knowledge um, it, it has a lot to do with cultural assumptions that perhaps we don't share any longer about the, um, the connection between certain types of activities and the divine. So uh, he makes the point that when we're free and at leisure, we can afford to uh, engage in philosophy uh, because it's at those moments that we share most closely the condition of the gods. It's the gods who have the ability to, you know, just sit around and contemplate theoretically the nature of reality. We mortals are stuck, you know, often in conditions of having to just scrape around to get by, um, you know, to earn our daily bread and to, to shelter ourselves and clothe ourselves. And we don't have the leisure of the gods to be able to just contemplate um, these um, primary causes or principles of things. So, uh, in one respect, then, um, wisdom uh, understood in this way as the um, theoretical exact knowledge of primary things is the um, subject matter that the gods are concerned with. Uh, and that would also suggest why he has this connection with exact knowledge, because uh, it's these sort of um, pure abstract entities, these mathematical objects that seem to be most removed from, you know, the um, the difficulties of hard scrabble everyday life. Uh, so this, it's more characteristic of the divine, and that's an attitude that we find uh, earlier in Plato as well, where Aristotle, no doubt, um, learned it. Um, but also. The gods are thought to be the primary causes or principles of things. And so 
they themselves might be the object of wisdom as, as well as its touchstone in the way I've just been describing. Because if we think of the ultimate explanation of everything, ultimately um, pointing towards the gods or a god, uh, whether you're a monotheist or polytheist, we can see this connection. Okay. So this leads to a second discussion question. Second discussion question I'd like you to think about is what do you think about this picture about uh, that Aristotle's painting here about wisdom and the wise? Um, is it accurate? Are there things he left off the list? Are there things that are there things on this list of the constituents of wisdom and the wise man that uh, he included that he shouldn't have, perhaps that you would take out that you don't regard as characteristic of the wise? Uh, or are there other things that are important for constituting a wise person that he doesn't include? Uh, that you would include. So think a little bit about this uh, characterization of wisdom that he gives in Alpha Chapter 2. Okay. So, wisdom is the knowledge of the primary causes. But what is a cause? The heart of Book Alpha is Aristotle's theory of the four causes. So if we look on page 12, I'm going to quote here the first few lines. This is um, 983a in the Becker and page 12 in, our, in the Penguin Classics. Okay, here's Aristotle quoting. Now since it is clear that we must grasp knowledge of fundamental causes, for we say that each man has knowledge when we think that he knows the primary cause, and the causes are spoken of in four ways, for which one cause we say to be the substance and the essence, for the why is referred to the extreme term and the cause and principle is the primary why. The second is the matter and substrate, and the third is that from which comes the beginning of the change. And the fourth is the opposite cause to this, the wherefore and the good, for this is the end of all coming into being and change. That, in that very obscure passage, uh, is the summary of the heart of, uh, in many ways, the heart of Aristotle's metaphysics, but certainly the heart of this book, uh, the theory of the four causes. So, um, let's try to clarify this a little bit more, and I'm going to use my handy-dandy uh, whiteboard here. So we have the theory of the four causes. Now, um, the terms that Aristotle uses for this are not the terms by which these um, causes have become handed down to us in the tradition of Western philosophy. Uh, those are the terms that were assigned to Aristotle's four causes by the subsequent scholastic tradition, which will be an object of a future series of videos. Um, so I'm going to connect the quotations from the passage I just read here with um, a kind of definition, simple sketch definition of what these uh, things are referring to, uh, and then the names by which they're more commonly known, which I will be referring to them in my commentary, just for the sake of um, brevity and conciseness. So the first thing is um, what he calls the substance or the essence. Um, providing the form that it realizes. The form that the thing realizes. That, In other words, an explanation that provides the form that a thing realizes is the substance and the essence understood as a cause. Uh, I think the clearest way to think about this is to think in terms of the questions that these various causes are answering. And they're all various forms of um, the, the following question. The question, why is this thing? Why is this thing? Um, and then the we have to add something more. So it's going to be, why is this thing dot, dot, dot? That's the basic form. Uh, and then how we fill in the dot, dot, dot is going to determine the different ways in which um, the, the causes provide the answer. 
So first we could say, why is this thing um, formed or shaped or constituted? in this particular way. Um, what Aristotle calls the substance or the essence is answering the question, why is this thing formed, shaped, constituted in this particular way? And this is what uh, became known in the tradition as the formal cause. The formal cause. Um, the second thing that Aristotle mentions is the matter or the substrate, which sounds a lot like substance, but it's different. Um, and that's the, um, the matter from which it's made, essentially. And that uh, answers the question, why is this thing, let's say, for example, stable or unstable? or for example, sturdy, oops, or fragile, or wet or dry, etc., etc. And this is known as the material cause. The material cause answers those types of questions. Why is this thing um, for example, sturdy uh, or, um, what is it, stable or unstable, sturdy or fragile, wet or dry, etc., etc., etc. Those kind of types of questions are going to be answered by the material cause. Okay, the third is um, that from which comes the beginning of the change. I'm just going to summarize this a little bit here, beginning of the change but it's that from which comes the beginning of the change, not the beginning of the change itself. The beginning of the change would be uh, the effect here. Um, so it's that from which comes the beginning of the change. And this is answering the question, why is, and I'm going to underline emphasize is here, why is this thing at all? In other words, why does it exist in the first place? And this is the um, efficient cause as it came to be known. Okay, so the, the source of the beginning of the change answers the question, why is this thing at all? And of course, keep in mind, this thing might be uh, referring, and typically is gonna be referring to the state of this thing. In other words, why did this thing change from one state to another, right? And that's what the efficient cause is going to do. Why does it exist at all? Um, for example, um, how did this substance become frozen? Or how did it melt? You know, why did it exist in that state at all? Those would be forms of that question too. So it's not just a matter of, um, and typically not, that's not the paradigm case of existing from nothing, but existing in the state it exists, right? The beginning of the change. Uh, and then finally, the wherefore and the good. And this is answering the question, um, why, in the sense of for what purpose, which is one um, way in which we can pose the question why, when we mean for what purpose, for what purpose. Why did you do that? You know, for what purpose did you do that? That idea. Why, in the sense of for what purpose does the thing exist? In other words, for what end? Um, for what realization? For what perfection does the thing exist? Um, why are you building that structure in this way? Right? What is the end? of this project um, when it's going to be completed or perfected. Uh, that's what you're asking for. You're asking, why am I doing this? What's the reason in the sense of for what purpose are you doing this? What's the good of it? 
You know, why are you, um, you know, uh, supporting the framework of this building in this way? Why, why is that good? And this is what's known as the final cause related to the idea of an, of an end. So we have the final cause here, which answers the question, um, wherefore, or for what good, or why, in the sense of for what purpose, is the thing that says. So those are our four causes, Aristotle's theory of four causes, which is absolutely central um, to his metaphysics. Now, for Aristotle, all explanations must take one of these forms. All explanations must take one of these forms. And the problem that uh, Book Alpha is concerned with, to a large extent, is how can he prove that this assumption is correct? The rest of the book, or the great majority, is devoted to proving that this assumption is correct, which he does by surveying the history of philosophy up to his time, uh, what today we would call pre-Socratic or pre-Platonic and Platonic metaphysics, uh, to show um, three main things. First, he wants to show that all previous philosophers and schools of philosophy were concerned with the problem of finding the primary cause or causes. All previous philosophers and schools of philosophy were concerned with the problem of finding the primary cause or causes. Second, all the causes they propose fall into one of the four types in Aristotle's theory of the four causes. All the causes that they propose can be seen, can be interpreted, not that they understood it that way, but that they can be interpreted to fall into one of the four types. And three, um, none of his predecessors clearly saw the truth of the Aristotelian theory of causation, even though that's what they were sort of blindly groping towards. And so none failed to produce an adequate metaphysics. Now Aristotle is obviously very proud of his theory of the four causes. He has, he thinks, discovered something about the nature of causation or explanation that um, preceding generations of thinkers had failed to grasp. And this obviously suggests to us an important third discussion question. So this is a two-part discussion question, the third. First, is this a complete and accurate listing of the types of causal explanation? Are there things he left off the list? Are there things that he included in his list of causes that he shouldn't have? So I will lift this up here one more time for you to look at that. So is this an adequate list? Uh, what questions do you have about it? What's puzzling about this list? That's the first part. And the second, Aristotle, as we'll see later on, he favors the final cause, the, the uh, for what purpose cause, as the truly ultimate and primary cause. Uh, is this view justified? Which of the four causes or types of explanation is truly the ultimate, or are none of them? Do we just have four different equally valid ways to explain, with none of them being more valid or um, basic or fundamental than the other? So that's the second part. Uh, what's the relationship between these different causes? Uh, I just note as a hint that uh, in the modern world, we tend to think of efficient causality uh, as the most important and most basic, and in fact, even as causality itself. But Aristotle doesn't share that assumption. So think about um, why not? Uh, why, what might one think that something like the final cause or the formal cause um, are essential as well, or perhaps even more important than the uh, efficient cause? All right. Let's look on uh, number four then, or chapter four rather, of um, this book. Um, what Aristotle is thinking of uh, in his uh, criticism of the earliest forms of philosophy, more than anything else, is that um, they attempted to provide an explanation of things purely in material terms. Aristotle thought of the first philosophers as limiting themselves to the material cause, to the matter or substrate. 
And sometimes he has to really um, shoehorn them into this particular interpretation. But uh, the natural view, I think he would agree, seems to be uh, the natural philosophical view, the naive philosophical view, you might say, or the primitive philosophical view, however you want to describe it, uh, seems to be that the primary cause of things is a material cause. Uh, in colloquial terms, it's a kind of stuff out of which all things are made. Certainly the earliest tendency in Western thought was to reduce all particular things with all of their different properties to some single unitary substrate out of which everything else arose through constitution. Whether this was thought to be water in the case of Thales or air, for example, in uh, Anaximenes, or fire in Heraclitus, or all of these together, plus earth in Empedocles' theory of the four elements, um, and so on. So for Aristotle, a burning question is why do we need to suppose that there has to be some other cause other than the material? And Aristotle explains this um, in a paragraph towards the end of uh, chapter 3 which is um, page 14, where he says, um, this is the middle paragraph on page 14 in our text, it's um, 983, 984a, 984a in the Becker. Uh, for, for these thinkers then, one might think that there's only a single cause that's said in the form of matter. But as they continued in this way, the facts themselves guided them and forced them to seek further. For even if, as much as you like, all coming to be and destruction are from some simple thing or from several, why does this happen and what is the cause? <coughs> In other words, even if just take Thales as an example, even if all coming to be and change is just different transmutations of water, why does this change occur? In other words, the reliance on purely material causality is unable to explain change. And that, for, for Aristotle, is really the wedge that, um, you know, forces you to uh, separate yourself from a pure materialism, a pure physicalism, a pure material causal explanation of things. Uh, because the material itself cannot force itself to change. The substrate itself cannot force itself to change. It must have some other independent principle of change. Now, this is a question that, that we can discuss. And here's another discussion question. Is Aristotle correct to assume that the material, the stuff, the substrate out of which something is made, cannot itself provide the explanation for the changes it's un it undergoes? Is he correct to assume that the material stuff, the material substrate, cannot itself provide the explanation for the changes it, it undergoes? What, are, what other assumptions is Aristotle relying on here when he thinks that material stuff is just inert stuff and cannot change itself. Is he right that some radically distinct type of causal explanation is necessary for this? Now, um, another reason to think that there must be other types of explanation come up in uh, the fourth chapter, which is the idea that uh, continues to be very influential in metaphysics, that it's not just change that needs to be accounted for, but also particularly purposiveness or end directedness. And we see this especially in the organic realm. The acorn doesn't just change, but it changes in a certain direction towards a certain specific end. It changes into an oak tree. It doesn't change into a donkey. So that's where the final causality comes in, this idea that it's not enough to just say, well, it's made of this material, so it becomes an oak tree. That leaves a gap in explanation, a pretty stark gap. And in, in the fourth chapter, uh, Aristotle begins to um, note that some philosophers like Anaxagoras and Empedocles, both of whom recognize the need to posit some kind of quasi-psychic principles of mind, in the, in the case of the former uh, Anaxagoras, and, and love and strife in the case of Empedocles, both of these recognize that there's something like a kind of psychic 
quality to it as our minds are able to form purposes and, and direct ourselves towards ends. It seems like the explanation of things in nature needs to have something like that as well. But neither Anaxagoras nor Empedocles in Aristotle's mind fully uh, worked out the, the, this theory. They had, a, they had a glimmering of it. Um, okay, I'm going to skip to uh, chapter 6 since I see we're already over the time that I wanted these videos to last. And to just talk about uh, Plato a bit because uh, if Anaxagoras and Empedocles began to see the need for uh, final causes, it was Plato who uh, really invented formal causality, the idea of formal causality. And on pages uh, 23 and 24, uh, the opening paragraph of um, Alpha 6, uh, Aristotle provides a very helpful sketch for how Plato arrived at this idea of the forms. Some points he makes are that the forms were discovered by reflecting not upon natural things, but by reflecting upon ethics. The forms are discovered by reflecting upon ethics. Socrates, Plato's great teacher, accepted ethical definitions, definitions, for example, of piety, courage, virtue, justice, and so on, as referring to absolute unchanging universals, which were prior to the objects of perception. So in other words, uh, Socrates observed that our standards of things like justice are not derived from experience because we never experience perfect justice. Rather, we, we apply our idea or the form of perfect justice to the things of our sensible perception. So the direction of fit isn't that the um, idea has to fit the perceptions, but rather that our perceptions are, we demand that our perceptions fit the idea. So these definitions, these ethical definitions, seem to be absolute unchanging universals that are prior to the objects of our perception. That's Socrates' view. Now Plato extended this insight into ethics to other entities as well, not just objects of perception. And these entities were the forms. And sensible things, according to Plato, were spoken of in accordance with the forms, the forms with the capital F. Um, homonyms, things spoken of with the same name, existed, according to Plato, by participation. That's the key word, participation in the form. All things called tree are called tree by virtue of their participation in the form of tree as it were, with a capital T, treeness. So in sum, Plato discovered the principle of formal explanation. But obviously from this account and the universal experience of centuries of readers of Plato, there's not much clarity provided here about the causal relationship between a form and its participants. What does this mean? What does participation mean? So um, for Aristotle, Plato, he discovered this formal mode of explanation, but he didn't really give a clear account of it. All right, so that gives you a sense of how in this book Aristotle sees all of the preceding philosophers as just indistinctly grasping the four causes that he posits in his own theory. Um, the concluding chapters provide some uh, criticisms, particular criticisms of these theories, since I think uh, we're not in our modern um, world, steeped as we are in the discourse of modern laboratory science and uh, the ideologies of materialism and naturalism, we're, we're probably not inclined to uh, give much credence to Anaxagoras, Empedocles, the Pythagoreans, or Plato to begin with. Um, so I won't rehash uh, his critiques of those, but I'll just um, point out to you how uh, Aristotle in sum is drawing upon the entire preceding history and trying to glean from it what is true and good about the nature of wisdom and its search for primary causes uh, in order to develop it and take it further in his own directions. And we'll see more about how that works in um, later videos.